when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan in 1966, I took one of the first two or three courses in uh, OTS tropical fundamentals of tropical biology um, and came to Costa Rica for that, of course, and we went all over the country. And, um, then I taught a course in 79, uh, I mean, pardon me, 69, 69 and 71. 71, I coordinated the course with Doug Futuma, then taught as a resource faculty in 15 or so courses over the years. My research here at, at La Selva has started in, uh, in, well, the 80s with um, some mites that live in hummingbird pollinated flowers and ride around on the bird's bills. Continued that, and then I was in charge of the ALAS project along with Jack Longino, Arthropods of La Selva project, uh, which went on for 15 years between 1990 and uh, 2005 or so. And I've basically come to La Selva every year for the last 20 or so years. Also with my, my spouse, Robin Chasden, who works on tropical forest regeneration. Mm -hmm. Tell me how those early courses were. What what were they like? What kind of people did you have on them? What kind of, where'd you go? What'd you do? Well, we went some of the same places that people go now. The very early ones, we did not come to La Selva because it was still a farm. But we did start in, in Guanacaste at the Hagenauer farm, which was used for years. We went to Cerro de la Muerte, where I ended up doing part of my dissertation work. And we went to Osa Peninsula to the tropical science um, field station there at Rincón de Osa. And we went to what was then the Wilson Botanic Gardens, which is now Las Cruces Biological Station. Um, where else? We went to uh, Guapiles, we went to uh, Limón, even went to San Andres Island to do oh, yes, marine projects. Belongs to Colombia, it's off the coast of Costa Rica. So many of the same, same ideas now with the courses trying to see the different climate zones and habitat types that exist within the country. And you were teaching under the, the, the famous OTS model, the Jansen, Scott, et cetera. Yes, it, yes, Dan Jansen and Norm Scott were, were our teachers in the, in the first course. And then I taught with Norm Scott in 79. We were, okay. I was full-time faculty with Norm. And uh, it was uh, up every morning at, at dawn, and if Jansen was in charge, she sang the same song every morning to get us out of bed. <laughs> uh, woke up this morning, you were on my mind, he would sing. <laughs> um, and that was, I guess, an Ian and Sylvia song, if I remember <laughs> right. Uh, and the, the stations were one, one building, uh, the river station at La Salva a little bit later was just one building and had kitchen, dining room, dormitory upstairs, laboratory. The dining room turns into a laboratory in the daytime. Um, people found their way around the trails. There were no trail markers. The trails were dirt. Um, people carried machetes, which has no, long been not, not, not allowed anymore. It was uh, sort of more rough and ready than, than it became. I remember a lot of mud. <laughs> lots of mud. <laughs> lots of mud and, and uh, famous uh, episodes with cooks and so on. Uh, One of the things that's always fascinated me, I took the Vandermeer Gill course in 71. And uh, you and Doug Fatuma uh, are, are similar in that you have very strong theoretical um, ecology foundations to your science. How did that work in a field situation? Well, Doug and I coordinated the course in 1971, the other 71 yes, course. Yes, yes. And uh, we had uh, lectures on theoretical ecology on a regular basis and tried to tie it in as close as we could with real questions about tropical biology. So, I mean, why are there so many species of, trop of, of uh, whatever in the tropics? It's a, it's a question that goes back to Humboldt and Darwin still with us now and we were trying to solve it then. I remember we had uh, endless discussions about do plants have niches? Oh yes. And yes, yes. strangely enough they they acquired them after that and then they lost them when Steve Hubble came <laughs> yes, along. They so, did. <laughs> so it's still a question, whether, it's still a question whether plant niches are important compared to say bird niches or lizard niches. And so there was a lot of discussion and we from the beginning tried to make it a, a course that was deep as well as as practical. Yeah, yeah. And and who were some of your students? In in that course? Well, or in the in the oh course my, that you were... uh, well in in our seventy one course, um, three of them ended up being 
uh, NSF director or uh, program directors. Uh -huh. um, uh, others went on to be uh, uh, prominent in their in their fields of ornithology, and, and I, I you know I could start reeling off names, oh, yeah. but. Um, in, in my original course that I took were uh, Steve Arnold and, and uh, uh, Doug was actually our teacher in that, Doug Futuma, and uh, Steve Tilley and Doug Gill and people that, you know, later became very important in, the, in OTS courses as well as in their, their own chosen fields. Larry Gilbert was another one. Um, but one of the odd things, well, the, as, as you probably know from your course, uh, uh, the first courses between 66 and, and 71 had about 20 students and always there were 18 males and at most two women, which Doug and I did not want to go along with. And there we found out the reason was that the director at that time felt that it was improper for women and men to share sleeping rooms, sleeping quarters, so big dormitory rooms. And one of the stations had a separate room that only held two beds. So the entire course was limited forever to no more than two women. I don't know why it wasn't no more than two men and the rest women, but we know the answer to that one. So Doug and I said, no, half the people in the world are female, and we're going to choose half women and half men, the best we can get for the course. We met with a lot of um, resistance, but we did it, and, and uh, it's been that way ever since. <laughs> so that was a, an important breakthrough, um, a barrier that was uh, antiquated by then. <laughs> I remember once uh, giving a lecture in Japan and having one of the uh, professors in the audience asked me what was so strange about neotropical biology that there were so many women um, involved, what was going on. <laughs> and I, I, I think it stems in large part from that um, from those early decisions and the uh, the way that OTS facilitated women. Well, uh, there was a strong commitment to absolute equality in every way. We soon had women presidents. There were inspiring uh, women scientists at at the time that we we you know tried to tried to promote and bring into the courses and did it really made a difference to just just to have the accessibility of, right. to, to these courses for women. Yeah. Mildred Mathias was everybody's yeah. hero at that time, and yes. she was yes. one of the, the greats. Um, and did, was she a resource person? Did you? Uh, she was in two of the courses that I was uh -huh. that I was involved in, not in our not in the course that Doug and I taught. And but, and what was she like in the in the field? Oh, amazing! She always had her whistle <laughs> for the when we were riding on the bus. She would give us a. There was never a dull moment because we were on the bus. We had to learn about what it was we were going past and what it meant. Um, and she had a little um, referee's whistle that she'd blow to get our attention. And that <laughs> sort of was the, the respect she demanded and, and got <laughs> from everyone and when she was having something to say, had endless knowledge about plants and, and their interactions with other things. What was uh, the setting up the might hummingbird flower connections and then the Alos project. Oh, well, are... the, the mite, uh, mite and flower system I actually discovered during my OTS course that I took, or no, that I taught in 69, uh, discovered there were these little mites that live in hummingbird pollinated flowers at, at, the, at Cerro de la Muerte. And uh, there was a kid in the course who was from University of Georgia uh, who uh, uh, Richardson, his name was, and, and who offered to take them back because they had acarologists, people that study mites there to see what they were. So he took them back, and, and uh, Preston Hunter actually described two new species, which he named after Richardson and I, Richardson I and Colwell I. <laughs> um, and he only agreed to describe them on, on the promise that we would continue to explore their ecology and behavior because uh -huh. there are plenty of new mites. There's a new mite there, there, there yeah, that yeah. you could spend your time describing. But uh, so we went on to publish uh, uh, papers about about that, and and then I discovered they were in hummingbird flowers all over the place. They they had not been studied at all in the, in the wild. There were a few species known from heliconia cuttings confiscated at the Miami quarantine, but they didn't know what was going on with the birds. Heliconia yeah. being a hummingbird pollinated flower. Yeah. So I got started on that and worked on that for two. Well, I still 
published in 2000, but but uh, 30 or so papers over the years. And I got interested in the the ALAS project. Um, uh, Deborah and David Clark, Deborah Clark mainly, um, uh, was alert to new program announcements from National Science Foundation, and there was a new program being started called Surveys and Inventories. And she proposed that it that uh, be good for for OTS to get involved in this, and invited uh, Jack Longino, who I didn't know before that, and several other people to a meeting to see if we could plan a proposal. And out of that proposal came the first ALAS grant, and we then had four more from National Science Foundation. And so it went on for 15 years. We had 100 systematist collaborators around the world, specialists in different groups, and four full-time paratexonomists from the community here who uh, we trained in the taxonomist train to, to identify and separate species as much as possible. They did all the preparations, the pinnings, or putting them on slides, depending on what the creatures are. Every specimen was barcoded and databased and, and sorted, rough sorted, and then goes out to the systematists, and they do what only they can do, which is actually the, the mm -hmm. classification and description of new mm -hmm. species. And we ended up at the end with 15,000 or so species. Really? Probably 80% of which were new to science. Uh, and each one of them was, we had quantitative replicated collections, so we have a lot of ecological data that we're still analyzing not only for La Selva, but 3,000 meters up the Barva transect, um, up the Volcan Barva through Raleo Carrillo National Park. Uh, we have samples from all those, from many sites up that transect. So those data are all database and available to the public. Uh, it's a wonderful baseline data set for climate change, rain shifts as thermal zones move up the mountain in the next few decades. So we expect to be able to get some funding and repeat some of those surveys. So that's the ALIS project. So let me tell you another story though yeah, that yeah. is important. Um, so there were all these young women scientists involved in OTS and in tropical biology and young men too and by and by uh, there were pairings off and <laughs> babies were born and people dropped out of field work because they couldn't uh, you know they couldn't uh, carry on their family lives and and still work at a rugged field station. So I happened to be one of those, and my wife Robin and I were getting ready to have a child, and we went to the OTS or to the La Selva Advisory Committee, and and uh, to David and Deborah Clark, who were then uh, station masters, the station directors, sorry, and uh, we put together a grant proposal to National Science Foundation to build family housing, uh, so that people could continue their work when they after they'd begun their families, men and women, but women were by far more affected by this. So we got money for four family houses, which have been very successful. They are always full. There have been many OTS children at the station. There's rules to keep them safe. Um, but uh, there was before that it was forbidden to bring a child under 12 on, onto OTS property for liability reasons and so on. So that's been hugely important, and our two children, who are now in graduate school and and uh, uh, and and uh, college, came every year of their lives. This was their second home. They had the same Costa Rican nanny the, every time they came. They spent more time with her than their own grandmothers in the end. And there are other families like that that have similar stories of bringing their kids here to to work. And so long-term projects could go on. Like Robin's been working for 20 years on the same plots, and yeah. that made that possible. And um, I understand your your son may be. <laughs> yeah, our son our son got got bored hanging out with the nanny, so he started going around with the bird the bird tour guides, and pretty soon he's a, a good musician, has a great ear, and pretty soon he knew all the birds here, and and uh, what they welcomed his help, another pair of ears. And so from that he's he's uh, now uh, getting a degree in biology. He's, and uh, is, is interested in bird song evolution, and has spent last summer in the Amazon netting birds and so on with another another group. So he's looking towards being a tropical biologist as well. <laughs> These are parallel stories to the to the children who went with their parents to study the big game on the Serengeti. Yes, and exactly, Texas exactly. Grew up in a tent watching yeah, lions yeah. and elephants. We used to watch the wild thornberries when the kids were young. <laughs> They know all those all those stories. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
any thoughts, Rob, on where OTS is, is going and where um, the role it's playing now? Well, uh, I think that the, the, um, the infrastructure and the history, the data history that we have now accumulated at the, the OTS field stations are, you know, a, a, a perfect uh, baseline for future studies, particularly as climates change in the tropics and as land use changes. And it gives us uh, a, a way to look back while we're looking forward and to tie the past to the future with, with current studies and, and uh, future projections.